All right. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. We're just going to skip to the end and figure out how it all ends. <clears throat> all right. What have we been talking about? Church. The church. That's right. We're going to continue to talk about the church uh, today and for most of this month. We'll finish it here in the month of August, the series on the church. But we're going to continue kind of moving forward with another mark or aspect of the church this morning. But I just want to start by reading from Revelation 21, talking about uh, God's plan for the earth and what he's trying to do to change it and to transform it. Uh, we live in a time where there's a lot of concern, understandably so, for transformation, for change, uh, for things to be different. Um, so we're going to see how God plans on changing everything. So it says this in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So this city is actually a people, a bride. Um, and not just any bride, but a bride that's come to maturity, that's fully adorned and prepared for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will, wipe away, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain for the former things have passed away. <clears throat> and he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am coming, or sorry, behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end to the thirsty. I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Now it comes with a verse that feels like that clip at the end of the drug commercials that say all the side effects. <laughs> but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. <laughs> Come on, man. I mean, what is that? <laughs> great, isn't it? I just love it. It's all these great things. And then he concludes by saying, Ed, by the way, just so you know. Um, obviously, in this passage, he is talking about how the world is going to be transformed, right? That God's plan is to make all things new. Don't, don't mind that man, whatever he's doing there. Um, that God's plan is to transform the earth, isn't it? And God's plan is to have his presence in the earth. But you notice the focal point of that transformation it's actually not the planet itself, but it's the people. That the focal point is that there's going to be a people that become fully adorned and mature as the people of God in the earth. And that God's presence is not to be found in a place, but in a people. That he will be their God. He will be with them, it says. That the place of God's presence in the earth even now is the place where his people are that they are the place of his presence, the place of his transformation. And when God said, I will make all things new, he's doing it by making a new people. This is important, by making them new, by, re by again, causing them to come into their fullness. And when that happens, even the earth becomes new. It becomes transformed. And so that means, where is the place in which God is transforming the issues of the earth? Where is he transforming issues like racism, like sexual immorality, like poverty, like all these things? Where is the place of God's action in order to eradicate those things, well, it's in his church. That this is the place by which he's transforming. This is something we've talked about, saying how the church is a political answer to what's going on in the world. And something that we've misunderstood. That, um, that again, we've thought about ourselves as being people who are supposed to change the earth out there instead of the church being the place where people come into to be transformed. And I don't mean into a building, I mean into a people. You follow that? And by coming into that people, we go out into the earth, the church does, in order to make contact with the world to make disciples. But the place of transformation is in the church and in God's way. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that the church feels any less of a need for the, issue, the problems that are facing society. There isn't there's le that there is a less of a burden in our hearts to see those things changed. It's the acknowledgement that the place where those things can be changed is in the people of God right? And so we look not to the answers of the world for the very people who've created the problems to try to solve them, but instead we look to the creator himself, 
right? To tell us how to solve this. How do we solve racism? We believe God as the creator knows how to solve that. And his story has the power to solve that, right? This is the things we've been talking about. So we don't try to look to the world to teach the church, but instead we try to be the church in such a way that it teaches the world. Now in saying this, we acknowledge a couple things. We acknowledge that we're not perfect, Do you understand? When preaching this, what we're not saying is, hey, we have this all down. I think a cursory look around the room will show we are not a people from every ethnicity, tribe, tongue, and language. We have some learning to do. That's what we're acknowledging as a church to be a people that express the answer of the God in the gospel. You guys follow that? That we realize that, but we don't abandon God's plan even when it's not being expressed in fullness because we know one day we will be this bride fully adorned. And because we know this is what we're becoming, we follow that plan going down that road to what we will be in the end. And so we've been looking at the centrality of the church and the plan of God, of the fact that it's not just any grouping assembly of people. It's not just the people that believe things in their heart, but it's the people that are learning to live covenantally as the nation of God in the earth under the kingship of Christ. They don't just believe that he is the king. We're learning to be a people under his kingship. And we're learning to do that together with one another. We're not just learning to be individual Christians. We're learning to be a body together with one another and learning to be shaped and transformed by one another. And so we've talked about the gospel being central and the gospel absolutely being the action of Christ in the cross and resurrection, but being the whole story of the Bible, right? The whole story that shapes us into being his people, being the new Israel into the earth. We've talked about things like servanthood and faithfulness and all of these types of things. Last week, we looked at one of the marks that Jesus himself established. There are two marks of the church, actually, that Jesus, with his own words, said. Now, obviously, the rest of the New Testament is also his words, but he personally said, I want these two things to characterize my church. We looked at one of them last week, which was the action of binding and loosing, right? So binding and loosing or tying and untying, we could say, is the action of loosing people from sin and binding them or tying them up to the yoke of God, if we can say it that way. Loosing them from legalism and tying them up to the grace of God. It is, in a sense, the practice of discipleship and church discipline. And it's that a people committed to be that in one another's lives, that's where my church is. And today I want to look at the other mark Jesus himself established, communion, is the other mark. But I just want to say a couple things before I get to it, because I feel there's a danger at this point in the series as we begin to talk about these marks to switch back into a way of thinking that keeps us from becoming the people we're supposed to be. And what I mean by that is we live in a time in which the primary emphasis, even in the church, but certainly in the world in general, is about what you believe and what you say. And if you believe something and you say something, that's equivalent to action. So if I believe something in post, I've taken action. You guys follow that, right? But believing something is not the same thing as living something. And so there is this danger to become a people who believe things in our hearts that we're not actually entering into and living. That we can be a people that preach a gospel that says, hey, just believe in Jesus in your heart and you'll be fine. That's not the gospel. The gospel is because you believe, repent be baptized, and grow up into Christ. Do you guys follow that? Now, that's a pretty big difference. But we've not preached a gospel that's aimed at transformation. We've preached a gospel. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> we've preached a gospel that is aiming at not transformation, but instead just aiming at having certain beliefs in our hearts. Do you guys follow what I'm saying? And so because of that, we could say, okay, we need to be a church that, hey, we take communion, check. Hey, we do this thing, check but we don't become a different people through taking communion. Do you follow that? It's not about whether we take communion. It's about whether communion shapes us to be a community. And that's the concern, is whether we're engaged in these things in such a way that they change how we live, that we don't just come in for something like communion, take the bread and the wine, and go out and live any which way we want. But in the taking of the bread and the wine, we learn how to live the rest of the week. We learn how to be the people that God has created us to be. These aren't just rituals. They aren't just traditions. They're not just things we're supposed to get done like a series of tasks. They're actually things that establish us in a way of living toward one another. They shape our worldview in our actions. And so if we allow these marks to shape us, then we truly become the church. Because again, we just, this thing of transformation, it's important for us to realize our habits are actually the things that establish our loves and our desires and our character. 
And again, this is something not often understood. We seem to think it works by your loves determine your habits, but that's not actually how it works. This is one of the grace of God toward us. Your habits determine what you love. Your habits determine your desires. Has anyone ever in here ever gone like without sugar for a long period of time? <laughs> you already know why would I ever do such a thing? <laughs> but has anyone ever done that? <laughs> has anyone ever done that and then had something really sweet? And when you have that first bite of something really sweet, some of you might be like, it was glorious. But for many people, they say, <laughs> what many people say is, it was just so sweet, I didn't even like it. Has anyone ever had that experience where you're like, gosh, this isn't even any good. I had this recently with, I hadn't had soda for a really long time, and then I got a cheeseburger, and I thought, well, you got to have soda with cheeseburger, so I'll try one. And I took that first sip, and it was shocking to me how sweet it was, you know, having not had it for a super long time. And again, it's my habit of not having it that shapes my desires. Do you follow this? I don't desire it because I'm not used to it because I don't do it. Do you follow this? But have you ever noticed that the more sugar you have, the more you want, what? Sugar. Your habit determines your loves. The more you watch Netflix, the more you want to do what? Watch Netflix, right? The more you're on Facebook, the more you want to check out what's on Facebook. I mean, this is just, it's how it works. Now, this is a grace of God to us because you can change your heart by changing your habits. Isn't that not fantastic? If God can allow, if we can allow his habits to become the habits of our life, it can transform what we do. And if we can become a people focused on transformation, then we're a people focused on how we spend our time and what those things do with, or what we do with our time when we have them learning to be a people together. But here's the dilemma for the church. We spend most of our time doing the exact same thing the world, the world does, and then we wonder why our hearts aren't any different. And we wonder why our lives don't look any different. That we seem to think that as long as we come to a meeting on Sunday and we add in a few of these habits, we can live in the habits of the world and not be like the world. And I'm just telling you, that's not possible. And this is, I don't mean this as a, as a legalism like this. What I'm trying to do is offer you a line here in these marks of the church, trying to offer you the development of new habits that then cause you to become the people you're supposed to be. Because we live in a time period where I can't be certain, or you probably can't be certain that anyone in this room will definitely make sure that they read the word of God each day and allow that to shape their thinking. But we can probably be reasonably sure that you're going to check social media for sure. Did you see what I'm saying? <laughs> and somehow we don't connect those two. Like, wait a second. The world isn't trying to get your loves. It's just trying to get your habits. Because if it gets your habits, it'll get your heart. I just want to design Facebook in such a way that it's your habit. Because if I have your habit, that's all I need. Do you guys get this, right? It's not, I know it's my son, big evil conspiracy. I'm not telling you that. I'm just saying this is how the world works, right? This is how it is. That we are a people just drawn to these types of things. And they shape us. They make us different. I mean, just, I mean, again, I know this might seem like an impossible world to ever live in. But what do you think? Well, let me say it this way. The very habit of doing certain things, as I'm saying, causes us to be a certain way. Our society has changed in certain fundamental ways. Then when any, ever, any, whenever anything happens now in our world, the immediate reaction is, what are we going to say about this? Okay, this is, it's interesting. It's new. Even as a church leader, I never got these questions in the first, you know, 10 years of this because there wasn't this thing called Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram and all of these types of things. But now in the world, whenever anything happens, what does everyone have to do? Post. We have to say something. And it starts to shape what we do. Every reaction is speak and speak quickly. And if you don't speak quickly, then you're not in on this issue in a clear way and you're against it, right? You follow this, right? And not only that, it trains us in anger and frustration. You speak quickly and you speak from your anger. You speak from your frustration. You immediately respond to whatever's being said. You immediately come back to it. There's no patience. There's no measure. There's no waiting. It's not this. And it teaches us not only that, but that every opinion, everybody should comment on everything. Because we're all teachers and we're all people that should comment on things. You guys follow what I'm saying? Just the habit of doing it teaches you these truths. And you start to think this way and you start to be this way. And it's a very different habit than things like, listen, why don't you be slow to speak? Why don't you be slow to get angry? 
I mean, just that one habit in and of itself is amazing. Just slow down. Don't speak on these issues. In fact, maybe not all of us should speak about everything. Maybe social media shouldn't be a place we ever vent our anger. Maybe the anger of man never works the righteousness of God. Maybe these are different habits. Do you guys see what I'm saying? But the very fact, and again, I think all of us when asked, do you want to be that way? No, I don't want to be that way. Your habits, though, are shaping your heart. Do you think, just, just guess with me, do you think that if you took one month, and I know this is impossible, but let's just pretend it's possible. Let's say you took one month, and for one month you didn't go on any social media any of those kind of news sites, any of that kind of stuff, no TikTok, no all of that kind of thing. I know I just crossed the line right there. <laughs> but no, none of that sort of thing. And instead, in every one of those moments when you would have done that, you developed the habit of reading the word of God. You developed the habit of prayer. You developed the habit of reaching out to people, you know, in the body of Christ that need prayer or need help with something. You develop, you want to know about an issue that you hear about. You develop the habit of finding someone who's actually studied it and spent their life on it. And maybe doesn't even live right now and actually has something to say about it and you read a book about it. Just out of curiosity, do you think you'd be a different person by the end of that month? It's not rocket science, guys. Did you see, you see what I'm saying, right? It's changing your habits. What are you saying? Are you against all those things? I'm just saying your habits are controlling your life in the way you think. So you better choose them really carefully and don't be on autopilot, letting the world set your habits for you in what you're doing because it's going to tear the church apart. What is shocking is the level of disunity in the church because of social media on issues. It's shocking. Guys, it's really shocking. I mean, to be sitting and going at each other over masks and things like this, dividing the body of Christ, not even face, not even talking, sitting down and talking with people, but just all of the anger and, the, and all of this stuff going back and forth. It's not godly, is it? Didn't plan on saying all that. <laughs> Some of it I did plan on saying, but just not the last part. I'm just saying in all of this, guys, that we need to begin to choose the habits that God has for us in order to be the church because it'll tear us apart from one another in our opinions. The most important thing this November is not necessarily the most important thing, whether you vote Republican or Democrat, but whether you learn to be the church. Do you hear that? That's the most important thing and everything else can flow out from that. But again, our focus is on so many weird things. It even tears generations apart. There's an agenda in the church, in the, not in the church, in the world to tear generations apart. I was listening to, I listen to sometimes just put on like the Apple music hits just to see what people are listening to these days. It's always very depressing. But anyway, in one of the depressing moments, I think it was a new Taylor Swift album. Um, I don't know, she's changed her style again. I can't even keep up, but um, whatever the world wants her to be, I guess. I don't know what that is, but she, obviously I'm a big fan. Um, <laughs> But in the song, it was interesting because one of her lines that kept repeating is, when you are young, people assume that you know nothing. Something like that. You guys, anyone heard this song yet? So he's saying this whole thing, and I'm thinking, again, just the habit of hearing that is pitting generations against generations in arrogance from one another. That there is this agenda to divide this, you know, like, hey, there's a, there is a right, please hear this, there is a right optimism and go for itness and youthfulness. And you should embrace that, man. You should go for it. You should be, you know, like one of those, one of the Caleb, you know, like when he was young, when everyone else was saying, we can't go in. We can go in, man. Let's do this, okay? There should be that sense of it. And it should be balanced by a humility. Because the thing is, it's not like older people think you don't know anything. It's just that we know what we didn't know when we were your age. And we know you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> Did you follow that? And so you know the most you've ever known. Isn't that great? Right now, you know the most you've ever known. And it's nothing compared to what you'll know 20 years from now. And that's what you don't know, okay? So it's not like any, but there's a wisdom in that that says, well, wait a second, maybe we need to connect to generations again. Maybe there needs to be less of a throwing off of one another, but a learning to live together in unity in the church in order to learn from one another on issues, right? So how does communion help with all this? <laughs> Well, communion helps because communion teaches us to be a community. That's what the very word means. The word communion comes from the Greek koinonia. That's where we get the word fellowship. 
So the point of communion is not to take bread and wine. The point of communion is to teach you how, in me, how to be a community together in covenant with God and with one another. The point of it is not just to take the bread and the wine, but from the bread and the wine and from this habit to learn how to live the rest of our lives, to learn how to treat one another and everything else we go through. And the problem with the early church in Corinthians in particular is even though they were practicing communion, it wasn't shaping them into a community. They were practicing communion selfishly. Some were eating a lot of the bread. Others went without. Some drank a lot of wine. Some weren't drinking hardly anything. And there was not this care for one another. Some were exalting some gifts and demeaning other gifts is not as important. There was all of this thing. They were doing the action, but they weren't learning to be the community. And Paul said, that's not the Lord's Supper. You're eating bread and wine, but it's not the Lord's Supper you're having. And so it means it's possible for us to get together to take the meal and say, okay, well, we're obviously, we're a church because we take the Lord's Supper, but that's not necessarily the case. We might just be eating bread and wine, but we're not actually practicing the Lord's Supper. Practicing the Lord's Supper is that which teaches us how to be the church together. So with that in mind, let me read a few scriptures. I'm going to read kind of some of the main scriptures where the Lord's Supper is talked about, and then I'm going to try to pull out some practices for us or some ways of approaching this meal that help us to be the community of God. Luke chapter 22, verses 14 to 23 says this, And when the hour came, he, being Jesus, reclined at the table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is, that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another which of them it could be who was going to do this. It's an amazing moment. Jesus has lived his whole life. He's at the very end of it. It's the very night he's going to be betrayed. He sits down with his disciples. And again, if you put yourself there in the moment, and he starts out by saying, I've eagerly longed for this moment. Everything's been building to this right here. Everything's been coming. Tonight's the night it starts. Tonight's the night a brand new covenant starts to come into being. One that's never been on the earth before. And I'm establishing a brand new Passover, a brand new sacrifice, something that all of world history has been building toward this moment. And our whole time together has been building toward this moment, this moment in which you're now going to be my covenant people in the earth. And he says, I want you to have this bread because it's, it's my body that's going to be ripped apart for the sake of this covenant. And this wine, which is my blood for you to be a new people. And it's interesting, even in this context, he says, and therefore one of you needs to go because one of you is going to betray me. Because this is for my people. This, in that context, it starts to separate out those who are not of the covenant from these who are. This is an establishment of my covenant people who learn to live in covenant with me and with one another. I think it would have made an impression in you. Don't you think? I think it would have on me. <laughs> I think if he said, do this, I would have known, okay, in this action, it's not just taking the bread and the wine, but it's learning to be this covenantal people with him according to what he's about to do. It's learning to do this. And I need to remember to do this afterwards. And so breaking bread became central actually to the life of the church. One of the things they did when they got together is they always broke bread. I'm not saying it legalistically, like we have to have it every time we're together. There's no scripture verse that says you must do this. I'm just saying they did because it was of such importance to them. As much as they sang, as much as they listened to the word of God being preached, they broke bread together. All of it flowed in and out from one another because actually the breaking of bread in a sense was central because the preaching is the explanation and the outworking of the action that happened in the death and resurrection of Christ. The singing is the celebration of and the worship of God for what he did in Jesus Christ. So in a sense, it was central to who they were and how they met and what they did. So it says in Acts 2, 46 and 47, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Again, daily in the temple, listening to the word of God, listening to singing. That's what they did in the temple, praying, doing those things. And then also house to house, breaking bread with one another. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. 
And the Lord added to the church those who were being saved. Notice this. The way they lived together is what gave them favor with all people. We, uh, it's great to be hearing about all the witnessing going on and all that's happening. But sometimes in our witnessing, we can think of our witnessing as something I just have to do as an individual. And certainly I do need to do it as an individual, right? I'm not negating that. But it's almost like the whole pressure of the gospel is on me in this moment. Instead of realizing the witnessing of the church in the book of Acts came from what they said and how they lived with one another. It was an invitation into seeing how they lived. The way they lived caused them to have favor with one another. And it caused people to long to be a part of it. It says in another place in Acts, because of the way they cared for one another. Now, it also, they saw people like Ananias and Sapphira die because they lied to the Holy Spirit. And they also were scared to join it at the same time. And so again, as they see our life together and they see church discipline, they're like, maybe I don't want that. But when they see the provision and care, they think maybe they do. But it's all part of the witness of God in the earth. Our witness comes from the way we learn to be church together. It says this in Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Now on the first day of the week, which is Sunday today, when the disciples came together to break bread, why did they come together? To break bread. That was the focus. Why are we here? We're coming together to break bread. Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. You're welcome. I'll get done before midnight. <laughs> but again, they came together to break bread. They also heard the preaching but they came together in order to break bread to, again, learn how to be this covenantal people. 1 Corinthians 11, we've referred to it already. Let me just read this one as well before we talk about them. Is another place where Paul is laying out the Lord's Supper and correcting the Corinthians because they're not actually practicing the Lord's Supper and what they're doing. It said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after his supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. It's a pretty big deal. <laughs> All right, so let's look at these scriptures, and let's pull out some things. If communion is supposed to shape us how to be a community, and it's more than just taking the bread and the wine, what, is, what are the truths in here? What are we supposed to do as a people in taking communion that shapes us to be the church? And the first thing is this. We have to recognize Christ as the center of communion. It may seem obvious, but we need to say it again. That when we come to communion, we're coming to his supper. We're not coming to something we're doing. We're coming to something that he, by his election, has called and invited us to. It's his table. It's his meal that he's giving. And in a sense, and that one of the things about communion that can be difficult and frustrating is while on the one hand, Jesus often ate with sinners and tax collectors, when it came to this supper, it was just his disciples. And even in the practice of the early church, they would take the leftovers from their meal together and go distribute them to the poor. But this meal was just for those in covenant with him. That when we come to communion, we need to understand or picture it as us coming to Jesus at the head of the table, who's the one breaking the bread and the wine and giving it to us. We need to remember him. When you do this, remember me. And he's not saying remember me in memorial, like remember that I existed all these years ago and remember, what I, remember that I'm right there, right now in your presence during the communion. That's why you need to take a second and examine your heart because I'm there. And I see, just like at that table with Judas, when he's wanting to take that bread, but your heart's not with me, I actually see what's going on. Yeah. So examine your heart. Are you living in covenant with me? Because I'm walking among you. I'm walking among the lampstands, as it says in Revelation. I'm seeing these things in my church. I'm not distant. I'm a part of it. Are you taking this bread and your wine in remembrance of me, remembering where I am, remembering the fact that I right now reign and I'm seated at the right hand of the Father, not just what I did, but who I am. It's, in, it's present. Remember me. That right now I'm the one who rules in the earth. I'm the one who's making all things new. I'm the one that's transforming things. 
It's again remembering who Christ is. It's recognizing his body and his blood in the meal itself. Now, this has led to some confusion. Wait, this is my body. This is my blood. Wait, is it bread? Is it wine? There's huge debates in history about this, right? Protestants and Catholics have argued about it for years. Um, I don't want to get into all the debates, but I think that we can understand it in a much more easy way, in a practical way, if we just understand the point he's making. Surely it's just bread and wine, but it's not just any bread and wine. Let me give you a couple examples. My wife, when, uh, when we were dating, we spent three years apart, and so we wrote letters back and forth to each other on paper, right? So I've kept all those letters. I have them in a box downstairs in our, in our, in our house. So I have every letter she ever wrote me. Now, in one sense, they're just pieces of paper. It's just pieces of paper like any other piece of paper, right? And in another sense, it's not like any other piece of paper in my house. Do you guys follow what I'm saying? Yeah, it's still paper, but it's not just paper. It's like this ring, right? This ring right here. This is actually a, a pretty cheap ring. I lost my ring in the ocean in Mexico. Um, I, um, I won't go into the whole story, but I didn't realize at that time that red means you're not supposed to go in the ocean. You know those red flags? I didn't know they meant anything. I just thought those are big ways. This looks like fun. So I just ran out there. And um, after getting pummeled to the bottom about 12 times trying to get back into shore, one of the times the ring just ripped off my finger and went away. So this is like a $60 ring from those guys that walk the beach in Mexico, you know, because I needed a replacement. So there you go. Anyway, so it's not even valuable. Do you know what I'm saying? It's not even, but in another sense, it's, it's like every other ring, but in another sense, this is not like any other ring I have. You know what I mean? And if I, if I lost it, it wouldn't be just like, oh, I lost my ring. I mean, having lost one, I know. And not only that, if I did something wrong, like I was going to a bar and I decided to take off my ring to put it in my pocket, and you saw that action, would you think, oh, he's just taking off a ring? No, no. It means something. It's not like any other. You get what I'm saying, right? So when he says, this is my body, yeah, it's just bread. But it's not like any other bread in that moment because it's symbolic of the covenant. And so it has meaning. It has something else. It's just wine, but it's not like any other wine. It's symbolic of it. It works as a sign and a symbol of the covenant. And so because of that, we need to understand how signs and symbols work. Because again, we, we think of signs and symbols primarily just as something that represents something else. But a covenantal sign is something that represents something, but also something that renews it. Okay? Um, again, when we think of signs, because we often think of rings with marriage and stuff like that, we can misunderstand that there is power in a sign of a covenant. It's actually creative as well as representative, okay? Let me just tell you what I mean by this. So when God wants to teach us about something, he starts in the Bible from the beginning and he introduces something for the first time and he builds on it, right? It's called like, the, they call it the law first mention. It's just a principle. So if God wants to teach us about worship, he first mentions it in the context of Abraham offering Isaac. And he says, worship is primarily sacrificing your life. Now he goes on to say, you, you do that in singing, you do it in all these different ways, but at the heart of it is this. And so when God first introduces things, he shows how things function. And so the first covenant introduced in the Bible is the covenant between who? See if anybody can guess. Adam and Eve, right? That's the very first covenant in the Bible is the covenant of marriage because God is trying to teach us about our covenant with him. So in the New Testament, Paul says, hey, husbands live this way, wives live this way, not just because you need to know how to live towards one another, but because this covenant teaches you about the relationship between Christ and the church. Do you guys follow that? So it touches us, it teaches us how covenant works. So covenantally, God has given a sign. Now I'll try to be delicate about this. I know we're delicate about these things, but the Bible's very earthy and God created all this stuff, so he's not afraid of it. But, but, um, but when God created the covenant of man and woman, he gave something as the sign that both creates and symbolizes and renews that covenant throughout its life. And that is the act of intimacy between a husband and a wife, right? He says this, the two will become one flesh, right? And in the two becoming one flesh, I establish covenant. And he actually ties, it's that one that he ties to, therefore let no man turn tear asunder what I've joined together. Now I I don't want to get into big talks about this, but I'm just saying that's the covenantal act of marriage biblically. It's a sign and a symbol of the covenant. And so in our minds, we think we get married actually when we say vows. Biblically speaking, it's the act of intimacy in which God joins two and then he causes them to be covenantal. Now that action continues throughout their marriage as something that continues to renew the covenant. This is, it's going to come to something that applies. Don't worry. You're like, you are so off topic. All right. It both renews, it's creative. It actually renews and it confronts us with all the ways we're not living the covenant. It confronts us. If I treat my wife awful, 
I don't lay down my life for, but I try to enter into that renewal. Like, how do you think, oh, we're not going to get into how it's going to go. You just get the concept, right? That again, it's something that not just, re- there's something powerful in it that renews our bond to one another, but there's something also that brings accountability of, hey, this is how you should be living in service to one another, laying down your lives for one another, caring and providing for all her needs, that she should be in submission, that this thing teaches us how to live the rest of the time. It's not that I live that way to get this. It's that this teaches me how to live then, right? There's a weird thing in the church that's like, oh, live this way so you can have, no, it's the other way around. This teaches us how to do that. You guys follow this. That's what communion is, is it's something that teaches us how to live the rest of the time. Is there power in the act of communion? Absolutely. Some people died because they took it unworthily. It's powerful. It's not just symbolic. There's actual grace and power in it. And yet... It is symbolic of how we're supposed to live the rest of the time. And so we learn how to be a people. We take this communion and we're like, listen, I need to be someone who lays down my life for Christ like he lays down his life for me. I need to be someone who's repenting of my sin and living in this covenant. I need to receive the mercy and grace of God again. I need to remember it's not my works, but it's his sacrifice by which I stand before him. I, remember, I need to remember we have a king who's loving as we heard about this morning. You guys follow all this? Just this it's just bread and wine and all of that is there. In that moment, I learned how to quit my striving. All week, I've been trying so hard. And God says, here's bread, rest. It's covenant, rest. Do you see what I'm saying? And if it's sin, he comes and he says, listen, it's discipline. It's bread, but it's discipline. Repent. It's time to change. It's time to be different towards one another. So communion is both creative. When we say it's a sign, it's something powerful that reminds us how to live and creates us and teaches us. Again, let me just say two more things. The other thing communion does is we learn to live eschatologically, if I can say that, in communion. We learn to live oriented in our future, not our past. What communion does is Jesus comes and says, this is my bread and wine. Now I want you to remember, we're going to have a meal together in the future. That there's a future coming that's going to be completely different than this. But right now you live in the not yet. And I've already done something about it. I've already done something about it in my cross and resurrection, but it's not yet what it's going to be. And every time you take a bite, it's supposed to make you hungry. It's not supposed to satisfy. It's supposed to make you hungry for that one. No, I want the whole meal. I don't just want this. I want everything it's going to be. And so I need to start living in light of what's coming. One of the big differences between the church and the world is the world will teach you in light of, to live in light of who you've been. Okay, you want to know why you're this way? It's because this happened to you and this happened to you. And you always try to go forward like this. You see what I'm saying? The Bible teaches you to live in light of who you're going to be. You don't look to who you've been. You look at who you're going to be. When we see Jesus, we're going to be like him. So right now, John says, I purify myself. I start moving because that's how I'm going to be in the future. Because then the world culture is going to pass away and it's going to be meaningless because of that. I don't befriend the world and its culture and instead I live for him. Again, all of these statements according to the future. Again, because that's how it's going to be. That's how, because then Christ is going to be king over everything because then he's going to hold all people in judgment. Because of then, I'm going to start to change how I live now. And so every time we take communion, we remember the future. We say, this is coming So everything's got to change right now. This this community of God needs to look like that now. The communion, as it's the taste of the meal to come, teaches us that the church is a taste of the community to come. It's a taste of that nation that will be here in fullness in the future. And so in communion, again, we're not just going through routine. We're actually learning to live differently. I've been learning. I've been living like the old man. I need to live like the man I'm becoming. And finally, the last thing in communion is it teaches us to recognize the church. It teaches us to recognize that we're a part of a body. That it says this, that participation is not, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, is not eating that bread, participation in the body of Christ. Okay, what does that mean? And is not drinking that cup, participation in the blood of Christ. What exactly is he talking about when he makes that comment? He's surely talking about our salvation, but in the context, he's talking about something more that when we take the bread and the wine, we realize that we're a part of a body, that we take this single loaf, again, if you can picture how it would have been, and I take this loaf and Christ says this, see this loaf? This is my body. And he breaks off a piece and he gives it to Steve and Steve eats it. So where's Christ's body now? In him. And he takes off a piece and he gives it to Cal and he eats it. And he takes off a piece and he gives it to Jen and she eats it. Now where's Christ's body? It's in them. So where's the body of Christ? 
amongst us. When they look at each other, and now when Cal looks at Steve, it's not just Steve, he's part of my body. We have the same life within us. We have the same body within us. It's real and it's symbolic at the same time, right? You guys follow this? And it seems I, can, I have to live differently towards Steve because he's part of my own body. It means I have to think differently about him. I have to treat him differently. This is what it says, love your neighbor as your self. Communion teaches you to do that because it teaches you this is yourself. And in fact, to be more accurately, both of us are Christ in that sense. They're part of his body. And so the unity of the church was actually in the meal. That when they came together and if there was any sense of I'm not treating my brothers and sisters as truly brothers and sisters... And I still take this bread as if I'm act, acting as if I'm treating him that way. Paul said that's taking the body and the blood of Christ in an unworthy manner. You're not discerning the body of Christ. He doesn't mean Christ's body. He's meaning this. You're not discerning the fact that every single one of the people in this room who take this meal with you are part of your own body. That's what he's emphasizing. That's what he's looking at. That the visible, the church at that time, New Testament was visible. It was, you knew exactly who it was. It was all those people coming into the room to take the meal together. That's my covenant people. That's the people I'm working out my salvation with. That's the body of Christ. That we're all one within him, not, by, not defined by our ethnicity, not black, white, not male, female, not Jew, Gentile, none of those things, but the singular body of Christ. In communion, we learn that. And it teaches us the culture of that household, right? Jesus is the head of the house, the father or the big brother, actually, according to Hebrews, who's then breaking the bread and giving it to us. And so we learn, first of all, forgiveness towards one another. When we're angry at our brother and sister because of how they've acted, and then we see that bread, that bread tear. And we're like, wait, is the sacrifice enough of Christ enough for me to forgive this brother? Can I forgive them the way God in Christ forgave me? And we go to our brother and we say, I can't be mad at you anymore. He was torn for us to be joined to one another. He was torn for us to love one another. I can't do it anymore. That it teaches us how to lay down our lives just as Jesus was torn and laid down his life. It teaches us we need to lay down our lives for one another. Greater love had no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. I'm about to do that. This is what I want you to do towards one another. It teaches us, again, accountability and church discipline towards one another because it teaches us to confront one another. In the same way that Jesus confronted Judas, in the same way he confronted the disciples in that action, we also, again, confront one another and, hey, what's going on in your life? Are you really living this? I see you taking the bread. Does that mean you're going to stop with that sin? Does it mean you're going to stop sleeping around? Does it mean you're going to stop getting drunk? You guys hear what I'm saying? It teaches us to do this. It teaches us to value every part of the body of Christ, to recognize each other's gifts. That Paul says, again, in this same context, that there are some gifts that people don't see and we consider them shameful. There are parts of the body we cover up, but God doesn't think that way. And when you come to the table, realize what whatever, if you think it's a shameful part, it's still a part of the body and it should have special honor. So again, it's teaching us all these things. It's teaching us in terms of economics, how to give towards one another. Again, it was from the table that they learned that they were supposed to meet one another's needs. It wasn't a principle of generosity. It was, wait a second, we're supposed to all live from the same provision. So that means whatever money I make, we're part of the same family. Let me, okay, understand this. When my kids have supper, they're living from God's economic provision that he's given to me because they're part of the family. So my economic provision is not just for me, it's for the family. But all of a sudden we come to the covenant meal, this is the family meal. My economic provision is for the family. So if there are people in there that don't have needs, this is, again, this is what Paul was saying, you have your needs met, they have needs, and you're doing nothing about this. You need to do it. Again, others of you are just being lazy and not working and wanting everyone else to meet your needs. You need to help provide for the family. Communion teaches us that. Because it teaches us that, again, we are supposed to share as a household in the needs of one another. I think that as we start to do this in the action of communion, it just becomes more than just going through a routine. It becomes us learning how to be the church. And so when Jesus said, listen, do you know where my church is? It's in those people that practice the Lord's Supper. He's not just saying it's in those people who take bread and wine. He's saying it's in these people who learn through that bread and wine to be the church who actually are shaped by it and transformed by it and become the church and that we learn all that. How did you guys learn to be this way? Because we have this meal we share in which we remember Christ and remember one another and we remember the future.
Amen. All right, we are done. You are the commander.